I also think there was a, an interesting uh, flow there from your, your definition, Hashim, of um, how the cities of the Mediterranean are very much shaped by their geographies at many levels. And uh, your point, Ishan, about um, the intense relationship between regulation or lack of and the spatial structure of the city, which you then analyze. Now, we move together to the discussion. Uh, in doing that, we have um, five extremely distinguished speakers who know uh, an enormous amount, not only about uh, the uh, distribution of cultures in cities um, at uh, an international level because of the background they have, uh, but also in some cases a deep knowledge of uh, the city itself. So I'm going to ask by, uh, start, sorry, by asking Sophie Baudijandro, who is a sociologist who's worked very closely with the urban age since its inception, um, director of the Center for Urban Studies at uh, La Sorbonne, to start with her contribution. And I will be tight on time with everybody so that we can have a brief discussion uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Um, the, sto the scope of the topic uh, defines in itself uh, its limitation. There are indeed many cities in the world, uh, the evolution of which does not require any confrontation with the past, and out of mere charity, I will not enumerate their names. Obviously, um, this is not the case of uh, Istanbul. The position I would like to defend here is uh, based on the term confronting in the title of this communication. It is indeed my assumption that we are mystified by a past that contemporary observers tend to embellish by comparison with the difficulties of the present and the uncertainties of the future. I do not think that this position is legitimate. The past is full of queries and of negative accounts. But obviously, literature is among the guilty actors. Here, I'm sure in this room, everybody has in mind Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. And in the book, uh, Marco Polo cities are elusive, yet everywhere. All cities are one, and no one city contains them all. In his stories, the, his musings, the city is problematized and its dizzying possibilities are explored. But there is not just literature, there is history. History tends to magnify the lives of the powerful few and to provide the nation states as uh, the natural successors of empires. And uh, obviously we know better now, and we know that in the past, Life was harsh and full of spoliations and wars and lifespan was so small. I'm not going to develop this. I would like to ask three questions. What is transmitted? How is the screening process operating? Can the ephemeral, the transient, dig, dig in? And what can be done to uh, give uh, residents a sense of belonging and of care for the city? What is transmitting? I just learned that at the French National Library, there are four million volumes that have never been uh, required by anybody. And I wonder if Google is going to register them or not. Um, obviously, elites want to decide for the better. And we have in mind Baron Osman who at a certain moment erased chunks of the city for better health, for trade. With the emperor, he had the body politics in mind, but the subtext was that he wanted the gun machines to get in better in the city if revolted working class neighborhoods were going to erupt. We also know about China that uh, Many historical uh, neighborhoods are erased for a better future for, for the masses. Uh, obviously, there are enlightened minds among architects, urban planners, and designers who try both to keep in the past and offer uh, a more adjusted uh, present, uh, a, a, a 
present, uh, you know, taking in the requirements of our, our time. Second question, can the ephemeral, the transient dig, dig in? And here I see two obstacles, the jobs, it's Paul Virilio that says that we are obsessed with speed at our time. And it's true that many people follow the jobs where they are. They may not necessarily remain in the city. Secondly, as we just heard by, from the previous presentation, people who settle in may not sure that they will become legitimate owners of their plot. They will be threatened not only by poor newcomers, but also by the rich and maybe the state. And um, so we, uh, we, have, we may have then an explanation about the feeling of insecurity in the city. We know that three residents out of four are afraid of mugging, are afraid of assault. And um, I wonder if they know their neighbors. I wonder if they know who their neighbors are. There are also threats of terrorism present in every global city, and this city is not spared. So what can, we do, be, what can be done? How can we give people a sense of be belonging and of care about the city where they are? Paul Valéry used to say that if the state is too strong, it oppresses us, but if it is too weak, we perish. There is obviously a middle road uh, to find. We have the Greeks in mind. They provided forums and agoras where the city, citizens could engage in a conversation and also see the workings of the government and get a sort of sense of decision making. I think that explaining decisions is just as important as making decisions for the citizens. It is likely that if democratic practices are enforced, collective life and differences may mutually coexist. If citizens are caught in a collective engagement, we have then the foundation for political citizenship and for future rights. Then residents will inhabit the city, appropriate its collective memory. Then the city will act as a promise, a link, a place where something happens. Thank you. To Aisha Andre, yes. So Aisha, uh, please, Aisha Andre, yes. Um, since I have a very limited amount of time, rather than um, make my own um, statements, I am going to address a few questions to the topic of um, um, confronting history, which is in the title of this session. Um, and perhaps raise a few questions about the talks themselves. Um, now, uh, I enjoyed um, Hashim Sarkis's uh, talk, but I also enjoyed reading his piece, which was in, in which is printed in the newspaper, and which is titled uh, "It is Istanbul, Not Globalization." Uh, in his talk, he emphasized the geographical location of Istanbul, the notion of hinge cities to some extent, or parallels between Mediterranean cities and the ways of thinking about them. In his written piece, he focused on or foregrounded Istanbul's imperial past, which I find more intriguing, frankly. Uh, uh, and it is... Uh, uh, global cities, imperial pasts, multiple, uh, is a topic that's never discussed as far as I can tell. So um, what then are the kinds of issues he brings up? What does, how is this imperial past um, relevant for today? I can at least think of three different ways uh, which are indirectly sometimes and sometimes directly mentioned in the piece itself. There is, on the one hand, his, his uh, references uh, to his own autobiography in the piece, um, uh, which uh, raises questions about the trauma of ethnic cleansings, which accompanied the dissolution of Ottoman Empire and the rise of Ankara as the 
as emblematic of Turkey's modernity as a nation state. Uh, so in this sense, it reminds us of the ways in which history is implicated in the present through traumatic events, ethnic cleansings, etc., in a lot of 20th century nationalisms, let us say, if, if not too broadly. So in all cities which have been transformed through 20th century nationalisms, such traumas are um, perhaps, um, such traumas can be talked about perhaps, but I think Istanbul is <laughs> ranks among the first in terms of the ethnic cleansings that accompanied this process. Um, now, um, also, of course, he, his piece draws attention to a different, also to a different way in which the, the past is, is somehow implicated in the present. And that is, of course, the ways in which um, uh, the, the, his, the history of cities is marketed in transnational markets today. This is common to most cities, and however ambiguous it may be, most cities market their legendary history and uh, market themselves as city of culture. So certainly, Istanbul's marketing of its 2,000 years of history in transnational markets is a very significant way in which history is implicated in the present. Um, the, the Istanbul's, uh, the broader parameters of the transformation of Istanbul's history into uh, uh, commercial revenues is um, once again familiar and uh, uh, a number of people talked about it in, in their articles. Um, a series of urban restoration projects supported by coalition gov run, coalitions of government and corporate run interests have obliterated from memory some of the most densely populated areas of the city in the very recent past. This is a process that is going on and at the present as well. Um, but he, his talk, and each of these opens up a whole Pandora's box of uh, different kinds of questions, of course, but, but to, to make it short. Um, but I think that Sarkis's um, piece, that the, the, the written piece, also conjures in my mind different historical narratives of the Ottoman past. Uh, these are not official, unofficial narratives at the moment, but um, Istanbul's imperial past is currently a site of political struggle in the present. This imperial, what, which of the multiple layers of this imperial past represents the future of the city is a site of political struggle. Uh, and the piece by Sarkis, intriguing as it is, because it raises the question of how um, um, uh, imperial Istanbul's linkages with the Middle East and its neighboring countries are being revitalized now. It also, I think, um, presents a vision of Istanbul's future that is very much that of AK Parti. Can I ask maybe Hashim to address this now very briefly? Um, uh, it's an, can I continue? Yeah. Two more sentences. Um, because it's a vision uh, that uh, reaches back to 17th century Istanbul, to the tolerance of Islam towards Christians and Jews. Um, so it is a vision of a multicultural Istanbul, that is a buzzword, obviously, but one that progressively erases from the fabric of the city all signs of its 19th century belle epoque, multiculturalism. So, sorry to be directly addressing your piece, but I, but I think that it brings up a host of issues about the ways Istanbul's history haunts the present, if you like the term, and I think that we should think about the ways in which 
the history of Paris, the colonial history of Paris, haunts Paris, or Berlin, <laughs> or London. Okay. Come back. Can you both turn off your microphones, please? So, Hashem, very briefly, uh, very briefly, you will sure. respond, and no, then no, th Murat will... Thank you for a very generous and thorough reading of my piece. Uh, I wanted to respond maybe with several unrelated comments. Says, first, let uh, both the idea of the empire or empire capital and the idea of the Mediterranean city are uh, antithetical to what we understand to be the logic and order of the nation state. Uh, that my interest in both has a lot to do with uh, at least what I see as, the, as a positive move in the advent of the global age or global city and the urban age is that uh, we are now looking for other models to describe both the future but also the past of this urban age. And that cannot be confined to the logic of the nation state. And so the Mediterranean city is very uh, logic in terms of its connection to networks, its um, sort of uh, ambivalent relation to the hinterland uh, is yet, yet another confirmation of uh, the history of an empire in its, in its relation to its territory. The Ottoman Empire has exercised over uh, 500 years of its control of the region, uh, very different strategies, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. Uh, initially, it could probably be best described as a kind of plasticity that someone like Roberto Mangabera Unger has written in terms of relation between plasticity and power. Uh, but that later on, uh, it became much more of a visual, symbolic, uh, militaristic presence, uh, especially after the disappearance of control over the Balkans and uh, the European side. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the project of modernization that took place in the 19th and early 20th century between uh, Istanbul and the rest of the Arab world was more of a let's modernize together. And there was even a kind of rivalry between Istanbul and Cairo uh, that started after the Napoleonic uh, invasion, which could be an interesting model also to think about today uh, in relation to the kind of power relationships between these regional global centers and the rest of the region. Uh, that could be a, a fascinating thing to look at. Uh, but I also want to, mar to po point out that both in terms of its connection to the Mediterranean and its connection to the empire, uh, Istanbul has maintained uh, long periods of ambivalence towards them, that uh, the, the relation uh, with the Middle East today is more about an aftermath of having achieved a particular position that it's using the Middle East to kind of strategize globally. And I think historically we can say the same has happened. That's well, in your essay you mentioned Dubai Tower, so maybe um, it's the... Uh, the uh, Middle Eastern capital now coming into Istanbul. This is one of the powerful images now, isn't it, uh, of this new connection. And also maybe the Panorama Museum, which celebrates the uh, conquering of Istanbul, or Constantinople. Again, it's the imperial past coming back to Istanbul, but in a very ideological way. Uh, so I'd like to give word to now Murat Belge, who is written a lot about these issues. I'm not an urbanist uh, or an architect, although I must confess I also have some architects as my good friends. Um, so I'm interested mainly in uh, the Istanbul that I love. And from the 80s, I started uh, on the request of a friend of mine who was running a cultural uh, society at the time to take people around the city and show them. And so this is mainly my experience. Uh, before that, I was a sort of lone lover of the city and wandered alone uh, like a cloud, like Wordsworth. But then I started wandering around with uh, certain people, um, showing them places, etc. Now, uh, I will also want to start with this <coughs> history question, the, the confrontation with history. Um, <coughs> my uh, uh, premise is that uh, <coughs> I think we Turks uh, 
have not treated Istanbul properly. I mean, that's the way I feel. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, my main interpretation to un understand why is our relationship with history before our relationship with the city uh, via uh, uh, the medium of that relationship we have. Uh, what I would call uh, maybe sort of diametrically opposed uh, two basic attitudes towards this city. One started actually with the Republic, um, but also Turkish nationalism started with the Republic, and all of a sudden, all the glorious past of Istanbul, etc., did not really conform to the ideals of the nation state, as you were saying. Um, so we had to go to the heartland of Anatolia to discover the pure and uh, whatever un unspoiled soul of the Turkish nation. And uh, we had to get rid of uh, the, the Sultanate, first of all, um, because there was this crisis of legitimation after 600 years of empire, you're stepping into the republic, uh, and how do you legitimate that? So one method is to say the empire was bad, the sultanate was bad. So you make a parenthesis out of those 600 years, and to do that you go to uh, begin your history from Central Asia, and the further east you go into Asia, the Istanbul fades more and more. And secondly, uh, I mean, as you are punishing a city, you are punishing its citizens. Uh, and of course, foremost to punish uh, are those who are not Turks or, or, or Muslims. There were some ambiguities at the time. And so there was real neglect of Istanbul and more or less everything that it represented. Um, well, when I started, as I said, in the 80s uh, to take people around, this was during the, uh, the last uh, real uh, pre-modern uh, military coup that we had because we've been having post-modern ones since. Um, and uh, People in Istanbul were in utter boredom because in a sort of this militaristic atmosphere, it's made very clear that uh, you know, tomorrow is going to be as dull as today. So we're trying to find uh, forms of entertainment and so I started taking people around. And then I realized that this was, the, we, have, we were making a transition into the second uh, attitude towards Istanbul, which is nostalgia. Uh, nostalgia for what we lost, because you have nostalgia after you lose, uh, and you have no chance of uh, carrying it on. And so it was this uh, multicultural uh, Istanbul that we had the nostalgia about. In Istanbul, I can talk of two people, the, the DNA question, uh, the more cultured as you, the, the orange and the red Istanbul. Um, they go around the city, uh, around the main arteries. That's about all. They don't know what exists, uh, you know, on the next street from the artery. And then there are the blue and dark blue Istanbuls. And those people uh, were living in the areas where I was taking people to, to show them a synagogue, a Greek church, an Armenian church, and the abundance of these things because of that past. I mean, this is the place you can find the Bulgarian church uh, or a uh, Georgian Catholic church or a Greek Catholic church or an Armenian Protestant church, etc., etc. And of course, these were all full of surprise for these uh, people. And as you go to where these churches are, the children come to you and they start shouting, hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye. Um, so immediately uh, they realize that you're a foreigner and you realize you're a foreigner. Uh, um, so it's um, 
in this kind of uh, situation, uh, how can we talk about citizens? Uh, Gündüz uh, earlier was talking about leaving the city to the citizens. Here we have a strange usage of the word hemşeri, which means citizen. One man says hemşerim to another citizen. Where are you from? And, and, and logically they should be from the same city. Uh, but the answer is, uh, I'm from Kastamonu. The, and the, the, the person who asks the question is from uh, Tunjeli. So uh, this is the kind of uh, citizenship DNA that we have. Thank you, Murat. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you. Well, we have uh, uh, another person who walks a lot in the city, um, another historian, Orhan Esen. Uh, uh, he is taking tours around Istanbul from a rather different uh, point of view. And I wonder what the, there's a nostalgic uh, kind of tone in this conference from this morning onwards, as if Istanbul is, is at a turning point, as if something is radically shifting in the city. And uh, maybe you picked that up in your um, travels uh, in the city that, for instance, you don't take your tours to Sulukule, which is now a totally demolished neighborhood, which is now the sign of what's coming in the city today. So maybe we are feeling nostalgia. Maybe there is some nostalgia around lurking, which we don't put a word onto it. I don't know. Okay. Um Say just one sentence, because I made all that talk for the sentence, but I forgot the sentence. Uh, when I talk about this problematic relationship with history, the two types. One is a history that never existed, uh, and the second is another history that also never existed. So, so uh, um, we have to put this right. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to draw a statement, uh, indeed, uh, building up on uh, three uh, that were made before. So they will help me. Uh, Iksan's very uh, clear analysis uh, of the uh, spatial DNA. And the Ipsos Moris uh, uh, survey of Istanbul, in particularly in uh, the point of uh, security, felt and real insecurity. And Dita Leptas this morning's in, uh, very political intervention, uh, which obviously someone who has just spent one day in Istanbul uh, is capable to uh, perceive, but uh, our politicians are uh, possibly not. Uh, so we uh, hosted the mayor this morning. Uh, I think we just heard the opposite uh, type of a, a statement. So as a historical, uh, as a historian uh, dealing with the issues of uh, the built environment, of course, the first uh, thing you see is uh, in the city that the city has been fully erased and rebuilt in the, uh, in the previous two centuries. And interestingly, in, in the third century, so I'm talking about the 19th and 20s, in each of these centuries, the entire building stock of the city has been totally erased and has been rebuilt. In the 20th, a new building stock has been added, as Isan has put it. And in the 20, uh, 21st century, we are again talking about the urban transformation, which can you simply read as a third time total erasure and rebuilding uh, action. So what is it uh, all about that? Uh, the first one, uh, we can uh, also have already heard the name of uh, Baron Osman. So we can talk of the Osmanization uh, of Istanbul, uh, even in times uh, before uh, uh, Isan's explanations. So that city that was inherited from the Ottomans has already uh, totally erased and rebuilt the old classical Ottoman city. So uh, that uh, city that was inherited by the Republic is indeed a modernized city, an Osmanized city if you want to take so, and already an earlier form of uh, private property had been introduced uh, to the city. So we can, uh, if we uh, just go from a pure, uh, say, use right to the uh, full, uh, say, um, uh, property in terms of uh, making uh, capitalism on land possible. So there are indeed different uh, gray shades. And to actually say, was, uh, so Istanbul history is kind of just a uh, transition from uh, different shades of the gray, uh, so to speak. 
so uh, the, uh, let's say, longer 19th century from 1830s to 1920s uh, has been uh, totally erasing uh, that city. And the second process we can speak uh, of, uh, so the first one maybe we can uh, bring together with the concept of enlightened uh, despotism in a way and modernizing the city. But the second one uh, that mainly starts with the 1965 laws that uh, enables property in, uh, in the air is, uh, we can say, in a rather pragmatic way, it just enables uh, for the old uh, Istanbul middle classes to maximize their living space in an utmost period of uh, uh, demographic pressure. But today, if we talk of uh, an urban transformation in the 20, uh, 21st century, we rather uh, think uh, of two uh, areas. One is uh, the area where Murat walks around. So this is, let's say, the impoverished uh, uh, geography of Istanbul at the center. Indeed, mainly those parts uh, of the uh, 19th century Istanbul, which has, not, which has been rather slightly affected by the modernization after 1965, that had been converted into a slum area. And the second, uh, into slum areas. The second is uh, the areas, which again Isan has put as these informal uh, settlement areas, which indeed were very successfully converting themselves after 1985 into something different from a Gejekonda city into a post Gejekonda uh, city. And today we uh, attach all kinds of uh, negative uh, uh, properties uh, to the city. So when we talk about this urban transformation, we indeed talk of irresponsible property. So both uh, the inner city slums, which are targeted to the new law 5366, or the uh, informal settlement areas, which are uh, targeted to different older laws and which will be the target of a new prepared law, uh, of uh, urban transformation to in order to prevent, uh, let's say, disaster risks like earthquake risk. So in both cases, uh, the saying is the following. You have been entrusted property, but uh, you, uh, you dealt improperly or irresponsibly with this property. So uh, now it's time that we disappropriate you and uh, just give you, uh, say, parts of it back in order, uh, so just in case you are able uh, to, uh, to buy it back. This is whatever exactly what's happening in Sulukule, and is also uh, happening in many other uh, say informal settlement areas. Just at this point, uh, the reasons uh, are very multifold for this, but I would, uh, just want to point out to just one of them. I want to compare Sao Paulo's and Istanbul's security situation, as we have heard uh, in this uh, survey of an urban age. So the real uh, uh, homicide rate uh, in Istanbul is uh, three by 100, uh, per 100,000, which is one of worldwide uh, lowest. Uh, so just less than half of, uh, for instance, New York's. And uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, at the same time, Sao Paulo has 21 uh, per 100,000 uh, people are killed. So obviously, Istanbul is seven times more secure city than Sao Paulo is. However, if you just look at the uh, perceived insecurity in these two cities, you will see that Istanbulis by 74% uh, are afraid of being attacked on the street, where Sao Paulo's are only by 47%. So there seems to be a, a very particular uh, issue, maybe you can say it also as a package of our history, uh, the perceived uh, insecurity in Istanbul is uh, kind of irrational, there's an irrationality. And the major, one of the major drives of urban transformation is this perceived, uh, is this perceived um, uh, insecurity. However, we know by many other cases, the way our uh, urban transformation is going to happen, the way it is planned by our mainstream academia, mainstream polit uh, politicians and uh, uh, the industry, uh, we are possibly going to uh, produce a city which will be much more likely to produce real insecurity. Maybe if we have just once produced that city, maybe we will feel more secure as we, can, uh, as we, will, uh, as we will start, uh, as we will just begin uh, coping with this uh, real uh, insecurity situation. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to give the floor to Pelin Tan. Um, she's an art historian, and she's also doing lots of um, uh, different kinds of compiling different stories of the city um, and publishing these uh, different cities from artists, communities, and activist communities, perhaps you could uh, comment. Yeah, uh, may I have my notes? <laughs> uh, 
especially um, through my experience in the last 15 years when I worked a lot with artists especially. Um, I learned um, several different uh, representation of the city. And this is mainly uh, a different kind of analyze and explanation um, that often we sociologists, uh, architects, or even art, art historians do. Um, and these practices or this kind of representations by visual artists um, always um, comes from uh, everyday life practices. Um, I think the city has um, overlayered um, spatial practices. And it is not easy to um, describe or generalize um, uh, the differences, the thresholds, um, either in urban identity uh, level or in the mean of public space, the mean of share of public space, um, through uh, these kind of representations. And um, um, I'm, uh, how can we capture differing spatial narratives of different parts? Um, I always um, try to go to the street life, everyday life, how in the street I myself, uh, as an Istanbulian, and also, you know, as a, coming from a social science field, how I negotiate on the street of Istanbul. Um, uh, as an inhabitant, I, I live in a gypsy-occupied street since last eight years, and my landlady is an Ottoman Greek, and the other street, near street, is Kurdish community, and the back street is Arab community. I have to negotiate every day when I go out from my door and come back in the evening. Um, but as a negotiation is how we share the street, how we represent or, um, um, or self in the street and what we want and what we don't want. And there is a lot of conflict inside this practice. And I don't want to marginalize here and I don't want to um, make it an, an exotic element. Um, I would say it's a kind of sadomaso uh, practice. Uh, this is this is also a kind of relation. Your your relation yourself, uh, uh, both as an inhabitant and, uh, and a social scientist or uh, whatever scientist uh, you are, with Istanbul. Um, and this is a potential, I believe, of this conflictual situation, this antagonistic, uh, let's call like that. Uh, it says a potential um, to. Um, to analyze a city or to live um, different kind of experiences. Um, the last uh, thing I would say, I want to say now, um, as maybe Orhan Bet mentioned, uh, of course in the last few years we are under pressure of this municipal urban state-led transformation projects that affects the local communities and they are trans uh, move in the city, they are forced move or forced transformation in the city. This is also a kind of um, um, uh, problematic um, condition now, what is happening in the city. Um, I still believe um, um, this conflictual situation, this, this antagonistic practice can create um, a kind of way of uh, to call Istanbul as an open city. I remember, uh, I want to refer uh, your talk, when you talked about Calvino, um, he had a talk in 1974 in Milan called Kuala Etopia. Uh, what kind of utopia? Uh, and he was trying to um, comment on the recent cities. And he was, I will try to um, remember, but he was telling something like, um, he, for him, open city is a conditioning, becoming city, which is open. Um, and how um, communities come together, commune together, even they are uh, having their singular position, and they can um, create this body of uh, multiple city. Um, it's, it's, you can call it as a romantic way, but it's uh, also a kind of radical way, uh, as all romanticism is uh, radical uh, always. Um, thank you very much.
Well, as a way of wrapping up, maybe um, we've got another 10 minutes or so. Um, I think to pick up on Pelin's point about this romanticism or the utopia, I think Richard Sennett asks in his essay, um, is Istanbul going to be like Frankfurt or um, he says, is it little Venice, um, I think he's suggesting, but uh, maybe Pelin is saying, well, um, this kind of romantic idea, um, Frankfurt um, suggesting overly gentrified, sterile, um, maybe kind of cleaned up urban spaces. So I think that I'm picking, I want to just bring what was talked uh, in the morning here uh, to this table that Charles Arkader seemed to be saying, well, the story is finished in the sense that um, now Istanbul is entering a real capitalist um, uh, city development era. Now the whole success story, which was based on perhaps the informal Mediterranean kind of um, identity economy is now finishing. So we are coming to a new um, paradigm, if you like. Um, and, but I want to just maybe finish with this question, maybe Isan. I mean, is there something in the DNA of the city that uh, uh, will resist? And I'm Suketu Mehta was making this point of other voices, other narratives. Is there something in the DNA of this city and who are these other narratives? He uh, singled out journalists, but uh, uh, Chala talked about different resistance um, narratives. Uh, and do you see um, in the DNA perhaps, um, or Aisha talked about the imperial past, do you see clues as to, to make us feel hopeful? <laughs> and if you could address Sophie's question at the same time. Yeah. Yani zor bir soru ama bir şey hatırlatmak istiyorum. Ee, İstanbul'da e, 300 binadan bir tanesi 50 yaşından büyük. 299 tanesi 50 yaşından küçük. Yani mesela benden küçük. Ee, şimdi bu, bu realiteyi hiçbir zaman unutmamak gerekiyor. Bu Bina toplamından ibaret değil tabii ki bir şehir. Ee, ama yine de bu bir şey bir herhalde e, gösteriyor olmalı. Bir başkası da yani Frankfurt'un iyi bir benzetme olmadığını düşünüyorum. İyi bir ihtim yani İstanbul'un olabileceği bir şey olmadığını düşünüyorum. Ee, Londra veya da New York deseydi daha çok tartışılır olacağını düşünüyorum. A uh, couple of comments and <laughs> answers. Uh, first, to uh, Pedin's questions about my ambition to, to maps. <laughs> I think the, uh, the representation of space has uh, three components. The, the, the, uh, you've, you've got space as it is perceived, you've got space as it is experienced, and you have space as it is conceptualized, okay? And all these aspects are, of course, interrelated, and Henri Lefebvre talked about a trialectics of space. These are all uh, interconnected. I have only and humbly uh, concentrated on the representational aspects of space. I, can, I, I don't have anything to say about the, per I know the complexity of the situation, but the perceptive aspects and the lived aspects of uh, space are well beyond my competence. And when I come back to the issue Madame Sophie has <laughs> raised uh, on this, uh, this uh, new types of citizenships, uh, we are living uh, global cities as opposed to oppressed and the perishable, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the loss of the uh, sense of place, if I understood the, uh, the question well. I think, uh, I think that segregation is as old as cities themselves. But I also think that in the last uh, days, with the rise of this global economy, we, do, we are now ex uh, witnessing uh, a totally new trans uh, transformation of segregation. We are told we are transiting from urban space as a dramatic space to urban space as a topological space in which lives are lived 
side by side without touching uh, each other, okay? Uh, this, I think, is, a, is a, a sign of the times. We have to reflect upon it. Uh, if nothing is done, then perhaps uh, there, there are causes for concern. But I, th I also believe, I, I'm, I also believe that we would invent new ways of uh, creating a sense of community and a sense of place. Just let me add uh, something which uh, relates to both. I think that conflict is something very healthy. What you describe, of course, for, for your daily life, it must not be fun to have to negotiate your getting into your home. But for us observing violence, violence is the worst because uh, that means, uh, just as you said, atomized side by side people not talking to one another calling the, the police because they cannot even knock on the door of their neighbors if they are too lousy. Whereas when there, there are conflicts, at least there is some vitality and some commonality that is uh, expressed. That's what I meant. Hashim, to save your voice, you only have one minute. <laughs> I just wanted to comment about uh, the danger of essentialization in our understanding of cities. Rather than looking at what is the essence of Istanbul, uh, looking at how what we understand to be the city's DNA is actually coded. What I like about the way that you use DNA is rather than taking the term to mean what is essential about the place, you present it to say what is the code that has been written to produce the city or what are the different codes that have been written to produce this place because that would allow us to also rewrite them and transform them. Uh, Hashim, thank you very much. I would like to close this session and um, the first day uh, by making a very simple metaphor as we sit in this fishbowl looking out towards a history that we're not sure when it was. It certainly looks much older than it is. Uh, I think we've certainly tried to address the issue of confronting uh, history through the excellent presentations and the um, very precise comments from the panel. But can I ask you to join me in thanking all the panel and all the speakers for this session. Thank you very much.